So summer is almost at an end. All right. uh, and in my opinion, August might be the most polarizing month uh, of the year because of these three words, back to school. All right. um, yeah, it's amazing how quickly uh, this time has gone. Uh, throughout the summer, uh, we've been going through the book of James. Um, and as we're entering into our closing chapters, I thought it might be helpful to do a quick refresher on the audience uh, and on the um, author of James before we dive into our passage, which will be James chapter 4. So real quick, the author, again, uh, is James, a half-brother of Jesus. And this is the most commonly uh, understood and acknowledged um, uh, identity marker. All right. And his story, his faith journey is important to keep in mind uh, as we dive in to this letter. All right. James' own story is one that went from uh, contempt of Jesus right, and of Jesus' followers, and we see that in John chapter 7, uh, to confession that this truly is the Son of God. And 1 Corinthians 15 gives us a glimpse of that as after Jesus lived and died and then rose again, it tells us that he appeared to a select number, and one of them was James. All right. But James' story doesn't end there. He goes on to becoming a huge influencer and developer uh, of uh, early church culture, right? building that culture up. So God used him in a mighty way. Right? This is important to remember because when you go through James, there's a lot of commands that come at us, and it can feel as if he's so interested in what we need to be doing that there's not as much interest in what's been done for us in Christ. Right? And that would be folly on our part if we thought that of him. All right. His opening sentence clues us in to his foundation. Right? His foundation is resting in Christ, an acknowledgement of Christ as Lord and God. And so all the instructions that are going to come at us then essentially um, are flowing from a pursuit and a profession of Christ. And that's just important for us to, to hold together uh, so that we're not caught up in, man, I need to keep doing, 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 doing. But remember that even this author himself, right, his foundation, what's driving him? It's Christ. Right? It's not just doing good for goodness sake. It's because of an encounter with Jesus. Right? So that's the author. As far as the audience, it tells us quickly right after the first verse of James chapter 1, that uh, he's writing to the church that's been scattered, right? You can think about it almost as if it's the beginning of the global church expansion, right? And this is a time uh, where there's a lot of persecution, right? So the church, there's a lot of fear, right? Fearful for their life. You know. There's a lot of frustration, right? Frustrated with what they thought the Christian life would entail and then instead what is going on on a day-to-day -day basis, the unmet expectations they had of God. All right. And then there's fatigue. All right. Life beats you up pretty regularly. Life under a lot of trials and suffering will beat you up even more. All right. So there's a lot of fear, a lot of frustration, a lot of fatigue. And even though we're not uh, experiencing persecution of the level that they did, uh, we are familiar with those experiences and emotions of fear, frustration, and fatigue. And what's interesting in James is all of that is going on, and yet he doesn't really direct our attention to it. His focus is on, well, how are you still bearing witness to Christ and the lordship of Christ in your relationships with one another and to a watching world? We can be forgiven if in moments we would say to one another, hey, so-and-so, he's just tired. Don't, don't take it personally, right? He didn't mean to lash out at you like that. Hey, so-and-so is just not being himself. He's just under a lot of stress, right? We could be forgiven if we did that, and we do do that from time to time. But James doesn't give us that luxury. He said even in the midst of fear and seasons of frustration and seasons of fatigue, don't let that keep you from loving each other well. And what we're going to see in our passage is uh, the role and necessity of grace to that end. Right? So we're going to look at three points. We're going to look at our passions. We're going to look at our struggle. 
and we're going to look at our hope. And this is from James chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says, the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is the reading of God's word. We live uh, in a culture today that I would say is an intense clapback culture. Clapbacks are everyone on social media. It is on Instagram, it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's on blogs, it's on the news, it's on TV. Uh, and even if you're not on social media, you probably have clapped back to someone and didn't even know you did it. Right? So what's a clapback? Clapback essentially is a comeback. Okay? You're coming back and whatever's been said uh, to you or done to you, sometimes it's direct, you're directly involved, sometimes it's indirect. Sometimes it had nothing to do with you. You're just inserting yourself into the conversation. Okay. Now, clapbacks can be positive. Okay. They can be corrective. They can be uh, instructional in a positive way. Okay. Scripture, believe it or not, is filled with clapbacks. There uh, uh, is an example in John chapter 8, one of my favorite podcasters. His name is Jamar Tisby. He uses this example from John chapter 8, still, but the woman caught in adultery. And the scene goes like this, right? Jesus is teaching in the temple, and the uh, religious leaders and some of their disciples, right, are trying to discredit him, to turn the crowd uh, away from Jesus, okay? And so while he was teaching in this particular scene, they bring a woman uh, that had been caught in adultery before him, and more likely than not, they dragged her against her will before Jesus, right? So they interrupt this scene. And they call him out and say, hey, Jesus, this woman was caught in adultery. Now, the law of Moses tells us she should be stoned. What do you say? And they did this to try to test him, right? So Jesus says nothing and bends down, starts writing in the sand. We don't know what he was writing. So they keep coming at him. Jesus, I know you can hear us, all right? The law of Moses says she should be stoned. What do you say we should do? You're a man of God. What do you say? So Jesus gets up, calm, looks at them. Whoever is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Boom, clap back. <laughs> no response. There's nothing they can say. Okay? They all have sinned. They're all sinners. There is nothing they can say. Done. And sure enough, each one of them, starting with the oldest to the youngest, drops their stones, walk away. Okay? That's a positive clap back. Our culture today <laughs> is filled with a lot of negative, vicious clapbacks. And it captures well the spirit of these first two verses, right? There is just this desire to have the last word, this desire to put someone in their place, this desire to make sure that if you get respect, disrespected, you make sure that you push them back, you disrespect in such a way that they never think of disrespecting you again. Just this innate desire to bend things to your will. And so James begins and asks this question, where does that come from? 
it's a great question for us to pause on, especially in those moments, unlikely, after those moments, after we have done whatever, whatever we're probably un- uh, ashamed of, right? To ask, what drives me to that? Why am I so intent on having my way to a point where it will hurt others? It's a great question. And he goes and starts unpacking it, and he gives this answer, our passions. What he's getting at is to desire to what, what you want, when you want, how you want it, whatever the cost. To desire for life to bend to your will along with the people, the relationships, the systems, the ideologies in it, you name it. To desire, strangely enough, to pursue life to the fullest, but as we see it. And he gets at that at the end of verse 3, right? It's about satisfying your pleasures. Pursuing life to the fullest as you see it. Now, on the surface, there's nothing wrong with the idea of pursuing life to the fullest. And I would say we each have a wish list of things that we uh, would want or think we uh, would need to make life uh, better. For me, my wish list is pretty simple. It's three things. One, uh, my favorite actor is Denzel Washington, and so just a monthly lunch with Denzel Washington where he just <laughs> flies me out to wherever we're grabbing lunch. No big deal. Second thing is uh, freedom to leave work uh, whenever I get tired uh, without penalty. Okay? And for some of you guys, that will be within the first five minutes of getting to work. It's like, okay, I'm good. All right. Uh, and then the third thing is not having to clean up our kitchen every day. And my wife would say silent amen to that one. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with the idea of pursuing life to the fullest. It's how we're going about defining it. right? And what James is saying that our passions, the pursuit of our pleasures, when unexamined, unchecked, uninterrupted, will lead us towards warring with one another, will lead us towards coveting, will lead us towards uh, fighting, and eventually will lead us towards killing each other. And we know that this isn't just simply just physical, right? Sometimes it happens. It's mental. It's emotional. It's verbal. In Romans 7, Paul gives us uh, a glimpse at it in this way. He says, the the good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, that I keep on doing. I want to do good, but there's evil right there beside me. There is this inner battle waging in my inner being. He's just getting at the same thing that James is getting at. Now, Paul will go on to tell us the good news in the midst of that battle, but we'll get to that later. Our pleasures left unexamined, unchecked, uninterrupted, will lead us towards war with one another. I would say it leads us towards one end ultimately, and that is taking life. We don't need to be discipled or trained in killing one another, and we'll kill in so many different ways. We're experts, actually, at killing one another. We can do it with our silence. We can do it with our words. We can do it with our activity. We can do it with our inactivity. We can do it aggressively. We can do it passive-aggressively. We're experts at it. Where we need help with is how to be life givers. How to be a presence that gives life to others. So James continues in verses 4. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? And one of the questions that comes to mind is, what does any of this have to do with God, all right? We're talking about our pleasures and pursuing life to the fullest, all right? I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get by. I've got a family I've got to take care of. I've got to do whatever I've got to do to take care of them. If God wants to bless me, great, but I've I got to do what I've got to do. And for, for many of us, like, that's, that's the mentality, right? I just, I just, I need to do whatever I need to do. If, if that be cutting corners, corners a little bit, okay. 
that be a little lie here or there? Okay, I just got to do what I got to do. And James says, you adulterous people. So to make sense of that, you need to go back a little bit to the end of James chapter 3. And what's going on there at the end of James chapter 3 is James is contrasting wisdom, the fruits of wisdom, versus life in neglect of wisdom. And here, biblically speaking, right, he's talking about the wisdom of God. And he starts giving the contrast that one will bear fruit of peace, one who bears a fruit where you constantly get strife with others. One bears a fruit where there's mercy and compassion that's coming out. One will bear fruit where you're constantly judging. They are opposed to one another. All James is doing is echoing Old Testament language as he's describing wisdom. So in the first few verses where he says you don't ask, he's not talking about just, just asking uh, for whatever pleasures. Ultimately, he's talking about wisdom. And the reason why that's important to keep in mind is that wisdom in the Old Testament is talking about life. It's life-giving. Wisdom is life. <laughs> Proverbs uh, 8 uh, is a good example of it. It says that he who finds wisdom finds life, but the one who fails to find it brings harm to himself. All who hate wisdom love death. So a lot of the wisdom literature that we'll find in the Old Testament is getting at this idea. Right? What it means to be pursuing a life to the fullest, it's found in God. And James is unashamedly and unabashedly just confident uh, in his ex exhortation of that. So wisdom is a gift from God. Wisdom is found in God. And as he's already mentioned earlier in James chapter 1, if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. There's no one more than God that desires for you to live life to the fullest. He's the life giver. <laughs> The issue is how you're defining life to the fullest. Bruce Marshall, he's a 20th century Scottish writer. He's famous for this quote, that a young man uh, knocking on the doors of a brothel is in fact looking for God. What he's trying to say is, each one of us, there's a desire and a drive to find life and to live life fully, to live life well. But where do you find it? And so here then the tension being played out is you're free to pursue your passions however you want. But you and God cannot both be God of your life. That's the language of the adulteress that's coming in here. The people of God ought to know this better than anyone else. He is God, they are his people. They both cannot be God of their life. You cannot live life according to your terms and have God shape it according to his terms. Luke chapter 6, you can't serve two masters. You adulterous people. So whether you're serving the world, right, which really is just another way of saying it's more so you're serving your own ends, right? And operating and functioning within what the world deems as success versus failure, what it deems as good versus evil, what it deems as right versus wrong, right? When that becomes sort of your, uh, your uh, uh, structure, your system, right? You will find yourself moving towards a direction where you're at en enmity and at odds with God. You, you can't serve two masters. You can't have it both ways. Now, I want to pause here for a second because I, I think for many of us, uh, that's exactly the kind of game we're trying to play, that we will serve God, but not in all areas. I'll give you some of this stuff that comes naturally to me, all yours, and then I'll take over this stuff. 
And I think we forget who it is that we are trying to war with when it comes to uh, being in the throne seat. Right? And here, being in the throne seat of God. I want to give a quick example from Revelations 4 and 5. This is perhaps the most vivid example of the throne room of God. And, and, I, and I, I want to go there just because we can forget who this God is that we are audaciously saying, look, you're good. I'm going to be God of my life. So in Revelations 4 and 5, uh, it tells us the author, John, he has this vision and he's caught up into the heavens. And he's brought into the throne room of God. And there before him, he sees one seated on the throne. And it tells us that there's thunder and lightning emanating from the throne. And the one seated on it has this beauty about him. It's like crystals. There's blinding light all around him. And around his throne are four creatures. Majestic, terrifying. Each of them with six wings, each of them covered eyes with eyes all over. Right? You would be tempted to want to worship them if you were to see them. That they are surrounding the throne. And day and night, they can't help it. They can't stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They're in awe of who is seated on the throne. He's too much. He's too marvelous to comprehend. He's too wonderful, and they can't stop singing about him. But that's just one layer. And then it tells us that there are thousands upon angels that are also surrounding the throne. And every time when you look throughout Scripture, when an angel appears before someone, you know what that person ends up doing? They fall down in fear. They don't know what to do. It's a terrifying sight. And there are thousands of them that are surrounding this throne seat, all singing, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You can't get to the one seated on the throne, even if you tried. And then it tells us that there's a scroll in his hand. And it's a scroll that's filled with words of power and of authority and of things to come. It's words of mystery. To John, he's watching all this from a distance, and an angel tells him, kind of whispers to him, like, hey, what do you think's going on here? He's like, I don't know. And an angel of the Lord shouts out, who is worthy to open this scroll? And it tells us that there was no one worthy found in heaven. No angel, no mighty beast, nothing. In heaven, and no one on earth, no athlete, no scholar, no Nobel Prize winner, no parent, no child, no one is found worthy. And then it tells us no one under the earth is found worthy. No one is worthy to approach that throne. That's the God that we serve. No one is worthy to approach him. And so then it tells us that John is sad because if there's no one worthy, then what's, what can we do? What's the point? And then almost like a camera changing scenes, it directs attention to a lamb that was slain. And it tells us that there's the line of Judah. There's the one who gave his life to purchase a people from every tribe and tongue and nation to himself. There is the risen Lord and Savior, and he makes his way. Crowds part. And he says, Dad, I got this. He takes the scroll. And the most interesting thing of this passage is the song changes. It goes from holy is the one seated on the throne to holy is the one seated on the throne and to the lamb that was slain. Lord Jesus, you are worthy. It tells us that there's a day coming where every knee and earth under the earth will bow down before this Lord. You're competing 
when it comes to the throne seat of your life. You're competing with the God of the universe. The God whom you cannot just simply approach, and yet his grace brings you near. And his grace is what sends you out. His grace brings you not only just to come right near it, but to even just to sit on his lap because of Christ, because you're found in Jesus. And so perhaps it's no surprise that James will go from talking about this, from, uh, about the, the, the war that can, that can take place with God as we pursue our passions instinctively and intuitively and naturally to then the grace of God to help us pursue after God. It's no surprise that he'll bring in this language of grace. He opposes the proud, verses 6, but gives grace to the humble. And this begs the question, what is grace? We, we toss that word a lot. Uh, a wordy definition would be grace is a supernatural act of God to save you. That's Ephesians 2, 8, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, right? and it's not from yourself. But then it's also a supernatural of God to empower you to participate in what he's doing in through and around your life. That's a wordy definition. A less wordy definition will be grace is help. It's the help of God. It's help that is strong. It's help that cannot be manufactured. It's help that cannot be bargained. It's help that cannot be earned. It is a gift. And it's a gift which helps us to live life Fully. Now, I've been saying that again and again, right? Living life fully. What does that mean? Well, in Matthew 22, Christ sums it up for us. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love your neighbor as yourself. If I could expand on that, it's to live in the calling, in the gifts, in the personalities that God has given you for his glory and for the sake of being a blessing to others. And that's going to look differently for each one of us. That's living life to the fullest. So it's not a pursuit of cars, resources, money, all that stuff. That stuff is good and it has its place, but that's not living life to the fullest. If you want to do that, by all means, you're free to pursue your passions but you'll find yourself at war with others and ultimately with God because you cannot both be seated on the throne seat. But if you will pursue life to the fullest in how he has made you and called you, he will give you grace to that end. So in the last few verses, 7 to 10, James gives us examples of what that can look like. What does grace empower us to do? What does God's help empower you to do? One, to fight and persevere in the spiritual battles that you encounter. Sometimes that's going to be a battle within the mind. You'll be tormented. Sometimes it's going to be a battle of the heart, just a broken heart. Sometimes it's going to be a battle where there's a relationship that's been fractured. The battles, there are many. But the power of God and the grace of God is such that Satan must flee in those battles with you. Why? Because of the presence of God. It's not because of us. It's because of God's presence in your life. Satan must flee. So grace empowers you to fight and persevere in the spiritual battles. Second thing 
Grace empowers you to be intentionally involved in the lives of others. Drawing nearer to God is not just a vertical relationship. That does no good to anyone. It must play itself out in our relationships with one another. So for some of us, that might simply be a shift from, hey, we need to go grab lunch together, to, hey, here's my calendar. Uh, when can we grab lunch? It's just intentionally pursuing how to come alongside others. The nearness of God moves us to learn to work at how we can grow in relationship with one another. It takes work, no doubt about it, but he's given us grace to do so. Third thing, his grace empowers us to repent when we have wronged or wounded others, not simply saying sorry or my bad. That's not repentance. And though he uses language like gloom and, you know, weeping and mourning, what he's trying to get at, it's not a gloom and doom gospel. What he's trying to get at is that uh, the habits that we might be practicing in which we are devaluing and destroying others with words and actions, we need to turn from those habits and turn towards working to be a person whose presence is life-giving, who desires to honor others. That will not come naturally. Our instinct is to wound and move on. And yet this challenge is, if you do wound, pause. Return back to it. Humble yourself before God and before the one you've hurt. And that might be simply using language such as, hey, I hurt you. What do I need to do to make this right? His grace empowers us to do that which does not come naturally. And finally, his grace lifts us up. And that will look differently. It might be rest to those of you that are restless. It might be encouragement for those of you that are discouraged. It might be strength for those of you that are exhausted. It might be peace to those of you that are anxious or worried. It might be confidence to those of you that are scared. It will vary from person to person, but his promise is that he'll lift you up. This is the power and grace of God in our life, that he goes with us and before us. His grace is more than sufficient, is more than enough to help us navigate through this life, through the trials, through the fears, through the frustration, through the fatigues. Those things will come, follower of Christ or not. And the challenge in James is, as you go about pursuing life fully, who will be God in your life? Who will you let have the last word? Scripture, the power of the cross is God's demonstration of his love and his word of life in your life. He doesn't let sin, he doesn't let our uh, instincts and tendencies to want to harm others have the final say. He dives into that mess. And he gives us life in and through Christ. And he lifts you up with his son. The grace of God is that which gives us power, gives us strength, gives us energy to follow the one who knows the way out of the grave. That's the power of grace in our life. You need only ask. You need only ask. Just join me in prayer. Father, we we come before you, Lord, just with lots of emotions, lots of thoughts. Some of us are thinking about the weak from before, some of us are thinking of the weeks ahead. There's just a lot going on in our life, Lord, and we ask that you would meet with us. 
this morning. Father, we thank you that you don't play at life. It's not a game to you, but you take it seriously. You take our troubles seriously. You take our thoughts, our concerns seriously. And you've demonstrated your love to us at the cross in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for your grace, which brings us near to your throne, a throne that no one can dare enter before, and yet you draw us near, and you say, come, come, that I might lift you up, come, that I might love in you, come, that I might empower you to be my ambassadors of mercy and of compassion. Father, thank you for the hope and the life that we have in you. Would you go with us and before us this day and in this week to come? We love you, Lord. And it's your precious son's name we pray. Amen.